<laughs> what right do I have to talk about MLK? There's a lot of differences between, uh, between Martin Luther King Jr. and myself. I'm not a historian like the other speakers are this week. Uh, he's from the South, not from the North. He died when I was only three years old, so I never remember hearing him in person. And uh, I'll tell you a secret if you don't go past this room. He's African American and I'm not. I'm not just white, I'm very white. When I was young, I got lost in a snowdrift and it was three days before they found me. I would go to the beach and they would tell me to put a shirt on because I was blinding the lifeguards. So I'm very, very quiet. What right do I have to talk about MLK? Well, the reason I'm so drawn to him is because he understands something about the gospel. Something that uh, is easy to forget. Martin Luther King Jr. was born January 15, 1929 in Atlanta. When he was three years old, his father was officially installed as a pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church. And Martin Luther King Jr. was baptized a few years later. He received his bachelor's degree from Morehouse College, then went on to seminary in Pennsylvania, and finally earned his doctorate in Boston. And he was called to be the pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery. And shortly after he arrived, that very next year, Rosa Parks was removed from the bus and arrested because she refused to give up her seat, as we saw yesterday in chapel. And so the, the black American community in, in that city were up in arms. They didn't know what to do. And so a few days later, they gathered at a major black church in that area to talk about what we should do. The people were confused. They were angry. They didn't know what to do. And sometime during the night, somebody thought it would be a good idea if they heard from their new pastor in town. And so Martin Luther King Jr. got up and spoke. And he started off slow and began to work into a rhythm. He said, we are determined here in Montgomery to work and to fight until justice runs down like water and righteousness like a never-ending stream. And the people applauded and cheered and they were ready to work and to fight. And he reminded them of something else as well. He said, may I say to you, my friend, as I come to a close, and just giving some idea of why we are assembled here today, that we must keep. Now I want to stress this, in all our doings, in all our deliberations here this evening, in all the week and all the while, whatever we do, we must keep God at the forefront. Let us be Christian in all our actions. The crowd rallied around Dr. King, and something special happened that night. Someone later said, we gathered as a confused crowd, and we left as a movement. And as that movement began to grow and build steam, it also created more opposition. During the Montgomery bus boycott, King was arrested. In all, he would be arrested 29 times. In 1963, he was arrested and, and wrote his famous letter from Birmingham prison. It was also 1963, 50 years ago this summer, the King participated in the March in Washington and delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech. We'll hear more about that tomorrow. But today I want to focus on another aspect of Dr. King's legacy. You see, his call for civil rights was grounded in his faith. He said, I am first and foremost a minister. I love the church, and I feel that civil rights is a part of it. For me, at least, the basis of my struggle for integration, and I mean the full integration of Negroes in every phase of American life, is something that began with a religious motivation. And I know that my religion has come to be more than me than ever before. And I have come to believe more and more in a personal God, not a process, but a person. A creative power with infinite love who answers prayers. And his faith called him to live in even such a way that he fought for justice, but he did it in a way that demonstrated love. So he said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Hate multiplies hate. Violence multiplies violence. And toughness multiplies toughness in a descending spiral of destruction. Chain reaction of evil. Hate begetting hate. Wars producing more wars must be broken. Or we should be plunged into the dark abyss of annihilation. So King was calling not just for justice, but winning justice or a demonstration of love. A love that loves people even when they don't get loved back. He went on to say, I've seen too much hate to want to hate myself. 
I've seen hate on the faces of too many sheriffs, too many white citizens counselors, too many clansmen of the South to want to hate myself. And every time I see, I say to myself, hate is too great a burden to bear. Somehow we must be able to stand up before our most bitter opponents and say, we shall match your capacity to inflict suffering, but our capacity to endure suffering. We will meet your physical force with soul force. Do to us what you will, and we will still love you. We cannot in good conscience obey your unjust laws and abide in an unjust system, because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as cooperation with good. And so throw us in jail, and we will still love you. Bomb our homes and threaten our children, and we will still love you. Send your hooded perpetrators of violence into our communities at the midnight hour, and drag us under some wayside road, and leave us half dead as you beat us, and we will still love you. Send your propaganda agents around the country, and make it appear that we are not fit, culturally or otherwise, for your integration, and we will still love you. But be assured that we will wear you down by our capacity to suffer. And one day we will win our freedom. We'll not only win freedom for ourselves, <coughs> we will so appeal to your heart and conscience that we will win you in the process. And our victory will be a double victory. On well, August 3rd, 1968, King delivered his famous speech. The next day, Dr. King was assassinated. Martin Luther King Jr. was not a perfect man. He had his flaws, as we all do. But he was also a man of great courage and conviction. And his call for equality of all people was grounded in his belief in God, a God of love and a God of justice. And he believed that the people should work for love and justice. His call was, was, his vision was not to be realized when African Americans had to vote or when they didn't have to go to the back of the bus anymore. That was not his vision. His vision was far greater than that. He believed that God's people, that you and I, should never stop working for love and justice until justice rolls down like a river and righteousness like a never-ending stream. Thank you.